Good day, Strategy Gamers, and welcome back to episode 18 of our Let's Play series of War in the East 2, Berlin, or Stalingrad to Berlin scenario. Um, in this episode, we're going to be covering the air phase of turn 10, the first half of our ground movements, and we will then close out the episode. And in episode 19, we'll finish up turn 10, and we'll also introduce, uh, as we usually do, a new mechanic or feature uh, to the game. I think what we're going to do is start out as we often do, and that is looking at that seven day forecast, right? To see what the weather is like. So we knew coming into this turn from the previous episodes that the weather was showing a forecast of blizzards. And this actually came to be pretty close to the forecast where we have blizzards in the air on the ground this of course means for much of our front line we have heavy snow or snow so that was kind of what we had expected we go back to the weather in the air and we look at the forecast drum roll please it's better it's not great but it's better so i i think there's a decent chance that in turn 11 we might actually start to, to run some air directives. I don't think we're going to go from 0 to 60 uh, in the next turn. Um, but if this forecast holds up, and if there are any pockets of clear weather, uh, for sure we will run air directives. And I think we may start deciding that, you know what, even if there's a little bit of snowfall, we might start to do some ground support missions. I would say, though, that that may remain contingent upon our supply situations because I don't want to I don't want to be using a bunch of our airframes with high operational losses. If at the same time we are still facing the same supply stress that we have along our front line, if our supply situation is healthy in the areas that we might be able to do ground support, um, or other uh, air maneuvers, at the very least we'll probably end up doing recon, then then I think we'll have a, a chance to to get into some of it. But I'm, I'm encouraged by this, that in the forecast there are no blizzards, and again, I, I maybe need to, to take a course on reading meteorological, meteorological reports and see what do these different pressure systems mean. But I'm hopeful that this big circle up here, where there's clear weather, is going to come this way. Uh, but maybe that's too optimistic. What I'm a little discouraged to see is that actually there's some some rain and heavy rain over here, which I'm not sure we've seen. Yeah, maybe we have seen that actually. There has been rain there. I just missed it. Okay. And then when we look at the climate zones, right, this kind of matches what we'd expect. Roads, just to take a quick look, they've stayed pretty consistent where the road condition is average in most areas um, or otherwise poor. There's only really only one good road here, and this is, I believe that's from the Moscow pocket, um, heading towards, uh, well, heading towards Germany. So with that, we're going to close out of the weather screen. As I've done in previous episodes when the weather conditions have been so bad, I've already gone through and done all of our air settings to just make sure that air armies are resting, that they're not running air operations. And I think that when we look at this, just a quick overview, right, that's working because the health of these units, like let's look at the 13th Air Army, right? They have 177 airframes out of the 177 that they would normally need. Um, so they're, they're in good condition. Um, and that, that's consistent across most of our air armies here. Six air army has a few that they can get, but still doing overall pretty well. So let's go ahead and execute our air directives. And we'll let this simulate. If I configured all the settings correctly, we won't see any sorties flying. Still staying at zero. We're on day three now still zero okay so it looks like that works successfully in the ground phase i i think we're going to have a fair amount of action to do up north by leningrad and then maybe some by smolensk um, but as you may recall from the previous episode uh, 
uh, we find ourselves with the number of units on low supply grew again. It went back up to 138, whereas in the previous turn we had it down to 120, and it appeared that maybe we are making some progress. Um, so supply is the name of the game for this episode again, and likely for the next, um, I don't know, I'd guess four or five, six episodes, just because of how long it does take, right, to resupply entire divisions. And when we have 138 that are below 75% supply levels, it's, it's something to be cautious of. So let's take a look up in the Leningrad pocket. Um, if you remember, the Germans actually had successful counterattacks, which is kind of the opposite of what had happened in between turns 8 and 9, where we held them in Leningrad, but by Smolensk they had taken some, some territory. This time they actually broke through this pocket here, because we weren't able to finish off their isolated unit. We had kind of weakened these units that were holding the line. So they now do control, um, not control, they have a way out of this unit unless we can stop that from happening here in our turn. So uh, we'll take a look here. We, we held the line right next to Leningrad proper here. They suffered pretty heavy casualties, honestly, when you look at it. They lost uh, almost 1,200 men, 24 gun platforms, and 28 armored fighting vehicles. And most of those fighting vehicles um, were self-propelled. What I found interesting, though, when reviewing this is Tigers are making their ways to the front line. Um, and I think this is just kind of the first of a preview, right, of what we might face in the summer of 1943 as the Germans really crank up the production of the Tiger and other more sophisticated um, Panzer models. So they have 14 Tigers in this force, and we did manage to actually um, damage one of them, which is encouraging, but still 14 is something we need to be wary of. Most of their attack, though, was with Panzer threes and Stug threes. I want to take a look at the ground combat this time just to see um, just exactly what they're being used, and you see that everything that they had here was HE hits because we had no armored fighting vehicles, right? So all of these units were using HE. And I also think it's interesting to look at um, the the WESP and the Hummel, by the way, are you can almost think of them as more so art artillery pieces. It's just maybe so misleading, but um, they really are longer range, right? And may not always have direct line of sight to the target. Uh, so that's why you see the range being so much higher. But what I found a little interesting was that the Tigers actually looks like they were engaging just a little bit. I'm, I'm just going to keep pretending these are yards because I, I don't know if they're yards or meters. They were just 20 yards behind the most forward armored elements that they attacked with. Um, so they, they were not hesitant in deploying them. It does look like they kept maybe three in reserve or three never saw any action because only 11 had any type of um, ground combat statistics here. Um, but yeah, they, 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 they attacked pretty heavily, and we did suffer ourselves. 1,000 men lost and 44 um, uh, guns lost. When we look at that for ourselves we scroll down, we see that mostly it was mortars, but also these 45 millimeter anti-tank guns. And I really don't care that much. I, I should care a little, but I don't care that much that we lost these 45 millimeter anti-tank guns because a 45 millimeter anti-tank gun isn't going to do anything against a tiger and arguably um, some of those panzers that they were attacking with, right? The good news is the 76, uh, millimeters, we we really didn't lose any measurable amount of them. Um, and we also had the field guns where we, okay, so we lost seven there. Um, but the, the key was that we maintained our fighting force of the 76 millimeters, because then when they attack again next turn, we're going to need those to repel the strength of those Tiger units. So that's how we held the line there next to Leningrad. Then I think next we'll take a look at where they actually broke through. So let's see, when we look here in this pocket, the results of the battle, um, we find that we had two retreats and one route. I think one of the routes is right here. And 
800 men lost for them, 1,400 for us. Uh, they did lose 15 armor, but look how much armor they had attacking that hex. Um, it, it really is quite a bit. So again, here we see those 14 tigers rear their head again. Hands are threes, fours. Um, and it actually looks like this is that original force we looked at in the last ba battle, but they've added some Panzer threes, Panzer fours, and um, I think the Stug three F eights are are new. They had Stug threes, but not the F eights. So again, pretty pretty strong force attacking. I mean, sixty two thousand men is is a pretty decent size. Um, and what we have to keep in mind, right, when we look at what do we put in that hex to try to hold it next turn, is it something that can hold off 62,000 men? Um, because they're, they're going to come right back at it again, considering that that hex isn't going to have any fortification level. And when you have 220 armored fighting vehicles that you can deploy against one hex with 62,000 men, and they don't even have foxholes, um, it, it's going to be a tough fight. We then see um, that we actually got pushed. Did I just look at this one? No, this was even previous. Because we had pushed ahead here, if I remember correctly. So we actually had this hex and this hex from the previous turn. So it looks like we had two of the divisions probably retreat back to here. And then one routed as well, the 80th rifle. And here we actually had 23 of our own armor that were killed. And it looks like it was almost entirely um, T-34s, which is interesting. So, and, and to be, yeah, so five retreated, 17 were destroyed. Okay. So some pretty intense fighting up by Leningrad. We're also just going to take a look over in the map mode and take a look down here. We had moved into this hex as well. And in the first attack, we did hold, killed 900 of their men, 26 of their gun platforms. We lost 1,000 and 22 gun platforms. But you see our fortification level is reduced down to two in that first attack. And then in the second attack, what they did is they brought in, I think it was this LAH Panzer Grenadier Division, which we talked about in the previous episode of just how strong that was, and I think that's where the 210 armored fighting vehicles came from. And we suffered some very heavy losses here. Um, 4,000 men lost and 100 gun platforms lost. And when we look at... Yeah, so again, this Panzer Grenadier Division, much like the one in the north by Leningrad, also equipped with 14 Tigers and the Panzer 4Gs. So that's... That's a pretty serious complement of armor that we now are facing here and up north by Leningrad. Now that we've done all that, though, let's think about what are we going to do to try and stabilize the front and get rid of this unit. So first, let's just see if everything was as it is now and we attacked. We pretty clearly have enough to probably push them out, right? So the question is, can we move something here to this hex so that way the 121st Infantry Division can't retreat? So I think what we're going to do is take probably the 314th Rifle Division, and we're going to move them into this hex, which means we also captured the depot that was there. And now what we're going to do is to take all of these units, and we're going to attack 28.3 to 3.9 and they routed. And it actually looks like they did escape through the front line. I did not know they would be able to do that. That might have changed what we would have done here then. Um, but let, let's look at some of those battle results because those went up and down pretty quick. How did they get through? I wonder if it's because at the beginning of the turn, this hex wasn't occupied. That might have been it. They suffered almost no losses. That's a little unfortunate. But now we have to focus ourselves on how do we defend this hex from them breaking through again. So I think we're going to take the 198th Rifle Division, and we're going to move that up here. 
And then what is the next strongest unit that we have that can come up? Probably this 18th Rifle Division. We can move up here. It's really going to lower its combat preparation points, though. So I wonder, what if we instead take this 285th Rifle Division, and we move that up to this hex, and then we will take the 18th Rifle Division, and move that over here. I think that might work. We're just going to move some of these units to then occupy those hexes. Um, and now this is wonderful news, right? Because now we have, we don't have anything in our rears. We're not encircling anything. And all of our focus can now be returned to how do we defend this line and where can we advance when possible. I th think one thing we might do is this is the 21st Infantry Division. I think we might actually take this stack of units here and we're going to attack just to push them out of that hex. We don't necessarily care about advancing there, but I don't want them to have that hex as something that they can use to launch a counterattack. So now any attack that they go into this hex where we just um where we just took it back they then have to expend movement points into an enemy controlled hex which is going to reduce their combat preparation points thus reducing their combat value so i think that's the plan there and then we're also going to take up this 46 rifle division and we're just going to add them as a reinforcement here to this hex and the 136 can stay exactly where it is so all in all we had these two infantry divisions um, ultimately end up routing they had an infantry division routed um, but the important part is we've established this clear connection back to Leningrad now we have to hold it the longer we can hold it the better off we'll be we look at fortification levels really we have a lot of ones here in the south but near Leningrad we are pretty strong I would say this hex is going to be very important to get that up to at least a one or a two as soon as we can. I think what we will also do is take a look at some of these and say, you know what, like the, you are very high fatigue, like the 86 rifle division. Can we take you and can we assign to you an anti-tank regiment to help when those tigers attack again, right? That's my thinking here. And then we're going to look what we have. Probably going to take the second rifle corps of the 55th Army. And let's see if we can do the same thing. Let's attach the 690th Anti-Tank Regiment. And we will also attach the, I think, 5th Destroyer Anti-Tank Brigade. There you go. There's that. And then if we take the, I think we'll do the 285th, which is part of the 54th Army, we're going to, well, there's, there's nothing to attach. Okay. What about you, 314th, as a member of the 8th Army? Yeah, we're going to attach this anti-tank regiment. There we go. So we have these two HQ units that are currently right here. I'm wondering if it makes sense to move them up close. Uh, I don't think we're going to this turn. But if we can advance this line at all, I think we might ultimately move these up here to Mug. Um, because if we can get a depot here, that'd be pretty nice. And actually, if we go to Map Info, if we turn on our Logistics Info, really where it'd probably be best to have those HQ units is right here. But I don't know if that's still within range. So let's see. Looks like it is. And you? Yep, still within range. And we're going to take... We're going to take you off refit. You're back to ready. And we're going to take the 4th Army. We're going to move you onto this depot. Okay. So now that's done, I 
think we're going to hold everything right here. Right? There's no obvious opportunity for us to advance. We've established a new front line. Um, I do wonder if we can't take anything. Maybe we shouldn't have attacked with that. Because now this hex is pretty weak. I really didn't maybe think that through as well as I should have. Is there any opportunity to attack here with this security division and this mountain division? Fortification level is just one. I think we'd be better off maybe focusing down here in some of these hexes. So let's, for example, take all of these units here. It's 14 to 8 if we attach you. It's 19 to 8. Okay. You are part of the 4th Army. Your HQ is there. We move you up. Let's now attack 26 to 8. That's 3 to 1. Let's do it. And they were routed. Excellent. And again, the, the purpose of all this, right, is to try to get them to focus on reinforcing their line instead of counterattacking into ours. That's the reason for it. Then I think we're going to take this stack right here. We're going to. Actually, let's do. Yeah, just the 191st. They retreat. Okay. Alright, that's good stuff. We're not going to move into that hex, though, and open ourselves up for counterattack. We're going to hold this line here that we've established. So that's all good. Wonderful. So that takes care of our northern Leningrad pocket, I think. Um, this HQ unit is part of the Volkov front. Actually, the HQ units is reporting into that. That's quite a few. Okay. Yeah, you can stay right where you are. Let's move a little south now by Lake Ilmen. And here we're going to take a look at the counterattacks the Germans had. And we, we had occupied this hex right here. This has been a back and forth. Every single turn, this has been a back and forth. Let's take a look what happened. We had three rifle divisions retreat. This was a pretty pitched battle. They lost 1,500 men, 30 gun platforms, 30 armored fighting vehicles. We lost 5,000 men, 100 gun platforms, and 75 armor. So we certainly took the worst of it. Um, let's look at some of those detailed results on the armored fighting vehicles. So it doesn't look like they had any of those Panzer IVs or Tigers. These are just the SP units, like the Stugs and the Martyr IIs, which were so effective during the war. Um, but we, we destroyed a number of them, so that, that is good news. Really what was least damaged are going to be the West, which stay quite a bit further behind the line than the Panzer Jaeger 38. For us as the Soviets, the disappointing news is that we lost four of the KV-1s, um, which, which is really a shame, um, <laughs> considering their importance to us. Uh, T-34s, we have these two different variants because of the 1941 and 1942 variant. So the 1941s were probably getting a little dated as is now that we're in 1943. When we look at the gun platforms, I mean, we lost a hundred of them. Let's see here. And it looks like a number were lost in the retreat, so mostly the mortars. It always seems to be these 82 millimeter mortars. And then the 45 millimeter anti tank guns. Again, that I'd rather lose the 45s than the 76s, right? That's, that's really the gist of it there. Because when we look at the effectiveness, right, it's the 45s that. Wow, they really did see the brunt of it. My goodness. So at AP range, they were only 23 out. Wow. No wonder so many were lost. They destroyed 15 with AP hits. My goodness. The 76s, I just don't think they saw as much action as what all of this shows. Because you have this, these anti-tank guns, were only three of these infantry guns. Their range was actually pretty close in. And then when we look at those 82 mortars, when you look at the HC side, um, 
a total number of hits of 150 with HE shells. That's pretty significant. Again, the range keeps them pretty far from the front line. So a pretty heavy battle there. So we had retreated. And then after we had retreated out of that hex, uh, we see that they continue trying to press on into this hex. And we held them pretty well. Um, not too many losses to really cover here. They lost a few armor. But this is a different unit than what had pushed us out of the hex by Lake Gilman, because here you see Panzer threes were actually present. In terms of gun, there really weren't that many losses. So we held the line there. And then we also held the line here, where they did press against us. I'm not sure why they thought they were going to be able to break through. Um, they really were not close at all to breaking through. And the the defending forces rate, what, excuse me, defending forces held halt range is something I don't think we've talked about yet. So the halt range indicates that what distance from the front line there, from the enemy units, um, did we hold them back at? So how close did they get to actually breaking through the front line, getting to hand-in-hand -hand combat if the defender stayed, etc.? Sometimes the halt range, when you see that the halt range was 625, and it can be one of two things. It can be, you know what, they went all out and just had heavy casualties and didn't stand a chance of ever winning the attack. Or what we see with a, a further out halt range is that a lot of times it's the sign of a good leader. And we haven't talked about leaders yet, but we, we will get to leaders in a future episode to understand their impacts on everything. Um, but a good leader can recognize that, yeah, you know what, we're, we're 625 yards away. We're not going to be able to make it. So before we just rack up the losses, let's halt the attack and retreat and reform. Right, so that's probably what happened here, because they really did not have substantial losses. Um, but it also shows us that when we do have that halt range so far out as the defender, even if they had a good leader, it's an encouraging sign because it means either the leader thought they didn't stand a chance, or they suffered such heavy casualties they couldn't get closer to the front. So that wraps up the battle summaries around Lake Illman. And I think one of the first things we're going to look at doing is just, I really, we have such horrible odds against this unit here, but I really want to try to, to get this finished. So then these two armies that are currently encircling this so that they can finally move to the front line and reinforce our units so let's take everything we've got here and that comes to 50 to 35 and we're going to give it a shot and they surrendered 40,000 men surrendered that is a big win force it took us a while but that's that is a big help. If you think about it, right, each turn, on average, we've been losing 60,000 men across the entire front. And that's, that's 60,000 not only from the battles that we're attacking and being the defender and from counterattacks, it's also just the day-by-day -day casualties of, hey, you, you've got a soldier here, and then hundreds of yards away across the front line in no man's zone you've got a german soldier here and maybe there's a patrol maybe there's a sniper etc but there are casualties along the front line that are just natural attrition from being in contact next to an enemy hex so 40,000 men lost in one battle is is a good sign for us more of that we can do the better um and i think it's a little interesting because you compare how the gameplay feels with ebbs and flows of battles and victories in this scenario, how vastly it differs from the Operation Barbarossa kind of grand campaign scenario starting at the beginning of the operation in 1941, that you look at after action reports and reviews of that scenario and it's just, yep, encircled this army, that's 100,000 men that surrendered, encircled that army, that's another 50,000 men, right? It's just, it's constantly like that because of the fluidity of the opening of the war. By 1942, 1943, there really was a much more established front line where this type of action did not happen as often. I'm not saying it didn't occur, it just didn't happen as often as you saw in that first year of the war as, well, the Germans pushed from pretty much, I don't want to say Minsk, but 
drawing kind of this theoretical line here with my mouse from here all the way east towards Moscow. They took a ton of territory, and it was a very fluid um, campaign. Back to our actions here, though. Now that we've gotten rid of that unit, I think what we will do is start making plans for how we can advance here. And another reason for that is when we look at our supply situation, I think what we see is that we actually um, are actually in pretty decent supply up here because we have this depot, which is getting so much freight. Got 6,000 tons last turn. Um, and all of these units appear to be in good supply with a few exceptions on the front line, right? And most of those are exceptions are when you get further away from the rail lines and that, uh, these depots because they have to use those trucks, as we discussed in the last episode, um, which really decrease the amount of supplies that can make it when you're going through heavy snow and blizzard-like conditions across swamp and heavy woods. It, it's just difficult to do. So if we were to just exactly as things stand today, try to counterattack this unit, because one of the big things is this little pocket is going to be crucial to our success of being able to break out here. Because if we can do this, we open up, we widen the front, and these additional armies that we just freed up, they can go pouring through. That's the goal. That's what we want. We don't want to get stuck here, which then would result in this swampland having to try to push through here, which really is not going to be pleasant because of supply chain because of supply chain issues. So let's just first see if we take all six of these units and attack. It's not even two to one. Um, twenty four to fifteen. It's not awful, but I think we'd be putting ourselves in a position again where we're we're going to get hit hard as soon as we uh, move into that hex. So let's maybe take a deeper look at what we've got here attacking. So here we have combat value four, four, five. Here it's all threes. So is there an opportunity to swap out, for example, one of the threes with one of these guard units that's a five? So I think we're going to do that. We're going to take probably the 52nd rifle division as it has a little higher fatigue. I mean, it's not bad fatigue, but it's a little higher. So we're going to move you back. And then we're going to take you, the 28th guard, we're going to move you up here. And those are all twos. What do we have here? HQ units and one infantry division. And these are the units that actually got pushed back, I believe. So now that we've made that one change, if we attack, it's 26.5. So we only increased it by 1.5, but we're going to go ahead and we're going to press the attack. And they held. All right. That's not that great. I don't know that we have enough movement points to get out of this hex either. Okay. So they managed to actually hold, which is very disappointing for us. And here they have a fortification level of three. We don't stand a chance there because they have 89 defensive combat value. So maybe we do need to start looking at, can we push through down here? Because they're, they're a lot weaker here. I worry about situations like this where we've got the 95th infantry with combat value of 10. But let's, let's go ahead and let's start to put some pressure down here. So let's take those three units. Oh, wow, that's a 9.6. Thought it might have been a little higher. Okay, let's take all of these then. We're going to push here 14.5 to 2. So they were routed, which is good news. It's just a Luftwaffe field division. We're not going to move into that hex yet. Um, Again, just trying to soften the front a little. I don't think we're going to move here as it just just invites a counterattack, I feel. Uh, before we get too far here, it's important to remember that in the last episode, we actually built four tank cores using the build new unit menu. 
And then what we did was we took four tank cores that we had sitting in our reserve theater box, and we actually deployed them to the front. And I believe they deployed to Moscow, if memory serves correctly. Yep. So here are those tank cores that we deployed. Let's actually, yeah. So we have two tank cores here, and we're going to start moving them up here to the front. Now note, I'm not actually going to use um, movement by rail because I don't want to take away from the freight that needs to travel on this line to the front. So we're not going to use up any of that rail capacity that's sitting there. And we're just going to take these four tank cores and move them all up to the front. And then ultimately we'll get them to about, what is this, they'll die? We'll get them there and we'll probably have them sit, build up their combat preparation points. And in four turns probably, and this is, you, you got to think far ahead sometimes with this, probably in about four turns they should have full combat preparation points and their fatigue should be lowered. And then we should be able to bring them up to the front and hopefully use it to to once and for all push through and kind of hold this line south of Lake Gilman. So that's an advance that is planned for a month from now, pretty much. So those have been moved up. Continuing to go through the actions on our front line, let's look a little to the south here. And again, the supply situation does seem to continue to improve, which is very encouraging news. I think we might take a stab at what the numbers look if we attack here. So just as is, that's 12 to 4.7. Can we make that any stronger by maybe taking this 158th Rifle Division and adding them to this stack, I think? So I'm going to move the 46 Mechanized back. And I'm going to take you, the 158th Rifle Division, move you up. And now with these six hexes, we're going to attack, which is 15.5 to 5, so it's 3 to 1 odds. They held, likely helped by the fortification level that they had. Shoot. Okay. Let's have a brigade and two rifle divisions there. I think what we might do is... Let's take the 178th off the front line, and we're going to put the 46 Mechanized Brigade back up, just to try to reinforce that hex after what had just happened there. And we might, might actually move it over here, I think. Does the 101st have enough? No. I think we'd have to move the 186 Rifle Division, so let's do that. We're going to take this mechanized unit and move them up. Okay. And we have two rifle brigades. It's mechanized brigades. That's 9,000 men against a Panzer division. It's not awful, but boy, it's not ideal either. Do we have enough to just erase what I've done and just retreat? Oh, see, we'd be leaving that unit behind. I don't think we want to do that. Okay, so we, we didn't have any success or any luck there. Coming down a little further, we do have an opportunity to push on this front line, but I'm not opposed to waiting another week for these fatigue levels to drop a little, because that will happen more quickly as they're not in a hex next to the enemy. So we're going to leave that be. Back here, again, we've kind of got the same thought going on where I think we can just leave them as is, uh, to try to reconstitute themselves a little. But let's take, now that I think about it, let's take the 943rd. And let's move them up here to this hex to reinforce. Yeah, I think a small little thing like that might help to just try to discourage them from any type of counterattack here. And when we look, you see, we don't have any fortification level there yet either, which isn't great news. 
And then here we actually have, these are part of the third shock army. We have two guards units that don't have any fatigue. They're still in unready status. But I think we might move them up to help reinforce this line a little. I'm gonna move you here. I'm gonna move you here. Just to help reinforce everything. And you have very low fatigue as well. Your rifle brigade, so I'm gonna move you up to this hex again to kind of reinforce that. Okay. That's all good stuff. Here we actually have the Totenkopf SS Panzergrenadier Division. Um as well as the 28th Jaeger Division. And there's no fortification level. And we have this 5th Army, which if you remember, we actually moved from Brzev on the Smolensk front all the way over here to help reinforce this line. I'm glad we did, because we really needed the help over here. But looking at it, their fatigue isn't terrible. Combat preparation is okay. I'm wondering if we don't take all 6 and see what the odds are here. 20 to 13. I don't know that that's going to be enough. What would it look like if we took this rifle division here and had them contribute to the attack, I wonder? But then we're really stretching that unit where their combat prep and their fatigue won't be in a great spot. I think we're going to hold the line again. And I say that just because we still have units that need more resupply. So we can be patient another turn, I think, to try to let that play out. And I also think in some areas of the line, we probably do need to build up our fortification levels a little. Yeah. I know I had talked originally that these four tank cores were going to move down here to do the straight shot over to Riga. And I didn't, I didn't remember that when I moved them up to help with Lake Gilman. And I'm wondering if it doesn't make more sense to just hold the line at Lake Gilman and maybe concentrate our forces on a counterattack here. Maybe that's the better play. I mean, we didn't really... Probably will lose maybe a turn's worth of movement by having them go north a little bit first, but, but maybe we do have them come down south here. That's something I think we'll keep thinking about, and we'll try to keep top of mind for the next episode when we have to move them again. What I want to look at here is the rail overview. So if you remember from the last episode, again, we really stressed our initial conversation of the supply lines and logistics and how they work. And here you see that all of these rail uh, lines are now marked green, whereas previously they were yellow because these two hexes here were damaged because of the push through Rejev. But once we repaired them last turn, now we have two rail lines going to this front, which I believe is what really helped with our supply level we have through here. Um, so they haven't seen any usage yet, but next turn they should. And when we do the AI depot assist, it should build some depots here. Let's actually, it's not going to do anything um, now, but this way I don't forget because I'm paranoid about clicking that. Um, so we only had the one depot that was established here, but next turn I'm betting it's going to set one up closer to the front line now that we have these two rail lines feeding it. So that, this is pretty exciting, and again, taking these hexes a couple turns ago was so key because you do see that they are such a crossroads of the rail lines that it's critical to have access to them. So that's all good news. Moving along, uh, as usual, this <laughs> heavy forest area, we're just going to keep holding the line just as the Germans continue to do. Um, I see here that we just have this one unit that is really kind of the exception. Is it at least dug in a little? It's not even dug in. I'm wondering if it's worthwhile splitting off like this rifle division. I need to get off rail mode, sorry, that's why I couldn't see. I think we might take this rifle division here just to help that one hex. Because I worry about it getting counterattacked here. 
you know, actually, I don't think it will because their combat value is estimated at five is really what that comes out to be. Oh, sorry, six um, versus R13. So that's probably okay, and we can leave you just as is, which then gives us more opportunity to threaten this hex here, the Totem Cult SS Panzer Grenadier Division. Moving along, moving along. Um, this front line, if you recall, we had actually taken these units. We took them off the front line to lower their fatigue. That's been working quite well, and you can see their combat prep going up and their combat value going up. Um, so I'm glad we made that decision. They really didn't have any successful counterattacks anywhere along this entire front here last turn. So there's not anything to review. I wonder how aggressive we want to be some of these hexes because they it the appears they're having some supply issues and there's not really a hex where we have some numerical advantage we can apply i think the exception might be we brought over from here the tank cores i think it's better just to let these guys continue to build up their combat prep and lower their fatigue i think we're going to let them do that so again, just holding the line here because we, we pushed so strongly for so long against this that it really w did wear down a lot of these units. And they've brought in some pretty defensive positions here. Look, fortification levels. They've started to build up in some of the hexes as well. So I think we're probably going to stay as is everywhere along here. We might look to see does it... Here we have 17 and... It's pretty much all this fifth guards. So what would happen if we attacked here? So they only have 16. That's 11. If I bring this one up, that's what? 20. Yeah. 24 plus what we got here. Might be worth it. We could take the seventh guards as well. Let's do that. Let's push here. Let's, let's give it the old college try. So we're going to move that unit there. Then we're going to take this fifth guards unit, move them up. Then we're going to take the seventh guards. We're going to move them up. So now when we look at this, we've got 32 to 16 probably help this even further, where if we take this 238th Rifle Division, we can move them here. So now we're at 36 to 16. How can we keep making this stronger? Let's, we already have tank brigades assigned to you. Maybe we look at 2nd Guards Cavalry Corps. Let's assign the 240th Tank Brigade. I think we'll attach the Ski Brigade too, considering we still have heavy snow conditions. So that's fine. Here we have this Tank Corps. I think we're going to add to it this Tank Brigade. And we have 7th Guards. Do with you. Let's assign the 256, 248th Tank Brigade, and the 50th Ski Brigade. You, the 5th Guards from the 29th Army. Let's assign the 9th Guards Tank Brigade. Okay. So let's press here. Now it's 40 to 16. And they retreat it. Good. Good, good, good. I do wonder if we want to... That fatigue level is so high. That scares the crap out of me. Yeah, we're at fatigue levels 80 here. All of that may not even have been worth it, actually, because now the fatigue's just so high. All right. But we, we had a victory. We pushed them back, made sure that they're not going to build up a defensive position in that corner hex of the front, um, and gives them something to think about for next turn and what they're going to do. So that's good. That's good. 
And then this also gave us a little bit of room for these units to get better into resupply. I think we will take, though, like this 326 rifle division and move you down to help reinforce this front line. Because they have been known to have some counterattacks here. This 415th rifle division, we're going to move you down to help reinforce there. And then we will take you, the 1st Guard Cavalry Corps, move you down. We're just taking some of these units that we had in the reserve that we're trying to get a little bit of a rest. And we're moving them up to add reinforcements to our front. So now I think we're in a position with all of these where we're pretty strong defensively. So this should, should come out pretty good. All right. Liking the look of this. Down here, I think in a couple turns we might look to see if we can start breaking through on a couple of these hexes, but I don't think we're there yet. Have pretty strong units here, but so do they. A lot of armor on the front line here. I wonder if we can't break through in this hex. This is the weak point when we look at their line, which is just the fourth mountain division. For example, I wonder if we can't take this 15th, 15th tank corps, move you down here, and then if we take, say, Hmm. Probably the 31st guards. We move you over. And let's do one more, I think. Let's take from here the 399th. Move you down. So now, what do we look like when we attack? It's almost 3 to 1. Mortification level is 1. Let's do it. We're going to do it. They retreated. Okay. Good. Good, good, good. So this is putting pressure on them. This is another one of their crossroad towns. I don't think we have enough anywhere to move into there unless we took these tank cores. Which we could do, but that would really exhaust them. So we may just hold that as is. Okay. Continuing along, let's see. Oh, uh, here we have the 8th Jaeger Division. Um, but if we advance here, we just put ourselves to welcome an attack from the 5th Panzer. So I don't know that we're going to do that. And I should point out, right, like these three units here, all of them combined actually probably equal the total 8th, 8th Jaeger Division, but they split their units into smaller forces. Just like how we have, for example, divisions, and then we have brigades. Um, different levels, right? I don't think we want to push through there. So we're, we're fine just as we are, I think. The only thing to note, actually, now that I think about it, is, so, with our rail lines, Right, so we have a rail line here, and this connects this line. If they occupy this hex, that then prevents freight from being moved on the rail line, and instead the freight has to be converted to being moved by trucks across here. If they do advance, I think then we'll want to kick them out to make sure that we protect the ability of our supply chain to run through there on the rail line. Where I think we have better opportunities for advance are down here near our rail. And looking at the map, I mean, we are ever so close to actually pushing them out. But look at that defensive value of 145. So I think the only option we're going to have is to ultimately encircle the city. Yeah, okay. So let's do this. Let's, let's move you up. And then let's take the 27th Rifle Division and move you here. I think we're also going to take the 269th and move you here. I'm going to move up our HQ unit here to this hex with the depot. Kind of want to 
to move it there too. We'll leave it as is for now. The supply has been getting to them all right so far. Yeah. I think. So I'm looking at it. They have the. They have about defensive value of six, which means if both of these attack, it's kind of a two to one based off what we understand on the front line. I think we're probably going to be okay there. I think it's going to be even better if we can stay there and slowly build up some fortification level. That might take a bit still. Down here, I really do wonder though if we can try to push through in some of these. Problem is, we just don't. I think we have to move these two guys up. So we're going to do that. I'm going to move you up. And then I'm going to take the 5th Rifle Division. I'm actually going to move you over. Yeah. I'm liking the look of this a little better. If we attack here, it's 7.1 to 2.9. What if... Well, we don't want to weaken this front any more than it already is. We... Don't even have the whole line covered, for goodness sake. Really do want to kind of attack here against this infantry division. And again, give them something where they have to look at their front line, plug a hole, etc., instead of um, thinking about counterattacks. What if we took all of these? See, that's only one to one, so that's not going to work. Okay. Well, I, I think we're just going to have to be satisfied with having some progress on our front line, not necessarily getting any large victories. Again, if you remember, we can look at kind of the visual aid of the fortification levels that exist here to demonstrate how far our front line has moved, right? Because this used to be the front line. Now we're all the way down here to our rel. So they've really pushed them, so we've pushed them back quite a bit to have to form this new perimeter. I mean, we are on the city's outskirts, and this is some good victory points we can maybe capture. This might be an area, actually, where we look at our reserve box. At the end of the turn, we might come back to this and say, you know, do we, do we take some reserve units that when they come in, they're going to be deployed here to push through our REL? Because if we gave a REL two armies, I would say, worth of units, that should be enough to encircle the city and then ultimately capture it. So let's actually look at that now as the last thing we do before we end the turn. Let's see what we have in our reserve boxes, an option to, to bring down there. So we have these tank cores, and these are the ones that we actually... I think these are the ones, yeah, that we had um, produced in the previous turn. Kind of a fan of keeping these in reserve in case we in case they have breakthroughs in other areas and here we have these guards heavy tank regiments i'm assuming these have yeah these are all kv ones okay all of these so when we look at them Yeah, okay. And we have these mechanized brigades. Were we looking at trying to build a mechanized core, I feel? Yeah, but we had a bit of a gap there in terms of what's available. So maybe we take some infantry divisions, rifle divisions. Maybe we take some of these. They'll deploy ultimately, I think, to the Moscow. Uh, area, but then we move down to Orel to use them to try to to try to break through. I think we'll take this guards unit, this guards rifle division. We're going to put you to the map, okay? And then let's take let's take five rifle divisions. And deploy them to the map. 
So then next turn in total, we'll have six divisions that we can move down to help with our route. Have three more to do. One more. Okay. Maybe make an argument for some artillery regiments to just help with um, the bombardment of the city, but I think we're going to be okay. What is critical to not forget about, which I almost did, is that we also did some railroad construction brigades. And it looks like they're in a position that they could probably be deployed. So we're going to do that. We're going to deploy them to the map. Because we need to fix railroads. Holy crap, we need to fix railroads. So important. I think what we might actually see is if we can maybe next turn deploy one or two of those down here to um, the caucus front, right? Might look at that. Or we might say, you know what, let's just pre-position them for Stalingrad. Let's go back here to where we left off on the map with Orel. Oh, turn off railroad. And let's also just take a look at our um, reinforcement and withdrawal schedule. So we see that next turn, turn 11, we're going to have the three railroad construction brigades. We're going to have a total of, well, I actually did one too many, a total of seven infantry divisions one of them is a guards division and this tank corps is going to the soviet reserves okay yeah so that that'll be quite a bit that we're going to move up to the front and i think what we'll probably do then is have a couple of turns of keeping the line static as it exists exactly it is as it is today and kind of say okay this is our our starting platform our launching base and then what i think we might do is from Moscow use those infantry divisions and we'll probably move them by um, rail mode down here to the front line and then we'll let them build up a little bit and we'll probably sweep through I'm thinking right here on this side and try to come around behind them um, to encircle the city with any luck they might not even stand and fight in the city they may just even withdraw but I think this probably brings this episode to a close. Thanks for watching. Um, in the next episode, we'll go over the rest of turn 10 and maybe introduce a new mechanic as we usually do in the second half of each turn. Um, as always, thank you so much for taking the time to watch the series and the episodes. Should you have any comments, questions, or feedback, uh, please leave them in the comments section and I'll do my best to address them. And lastly, if you feel like subscribing or liking uh, on the channel here, it definitely helps get the name of War in the East 2 out there uh, for other strategy gamers who may be interested. It also helps introduce gamers to this style of um, getting into the complexity of these games, right? One turn at a time, one mechanic at a time, as opposed to finding uh, you have a 520-page manual in front of you and you stand no hope of ever understanding the game. Right, slowly immersing yourselves into the gameplay like we've been doing in this series. With that, just want to say thanks one last time and have yourselves a great day, Strategy Gamers. Bye now.